We are in a series on praise, and today and next Sunday, next Sunday is the last Sunday in this series, uh, and it's one of those things where we have been talking about what praise actually is and what constitutes real praise in my life and in your life. Today, our, our text is out of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. I have alluded to this in this entire series, but it hasn't been our text. Uh, Hebrews says, Therefore to him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Father, we thank you today for your word. Give us insight and wisdom as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to ask you today, what is the most important factor in developing your Christian life or experiencing your spiritual power? How would you answer that question? What would you say? Maybe you would say prayer. Maybe you would say Bible study. Maybe you would say Christian worship. Maybe you would say personal witnessing. And all of these things are awesome, and all of these things are important. But the most, the most important factor, uh, the most biblical factor in, in spiritual power in my life, in your life, in our everyday living, the Christian life, is to learn the meaning of the power of praise. When the Bible talks about praise, it talks about praise in terms of power. When the Bible gives us understanding on how to have power with God, it is through this process of praise. For an example, in Psalm chapter 9, verse 11, the scripture says, Sing praises to the Lord who dwell in Zion and make known to the nations what God has done. In Psalm chapter 33, verse 2, the Bible says, Praise the Lord with the heart. Sing unto him with a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Psalm chapter 67 verse 3 says, Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. And then our text says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise continually, the fruit of the lips that confess his name. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9, the scripture that we've used in every Sunday as our text but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, that we should show the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Child of God, I have discovered in my life, and I have discovered in my almost 50 years of preaching, that it is one thing to talk about praise in a general conversation but it is altogether something else. When we, are, when we are living in the power of praise in our everyday walk with Christ. When you study the Word of God, the Bible tells us, first of all, that praise produces victory. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 15 through 22. I'm sure you probably don't have that right on the top of your memory bank, but it talks about Jehoshaphat in Judah being attacked by the kings of and the armies of the Moabites and the Ammonites who greatly outnumbered the God's people. I mean, they were severely outnumbered and they were living in fear because they had the idea that they were going to be severely beaten in this battle. And Jehoshaphat said this, as God spoke to him, do not be afraid. You shall no need, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then in verses 21 and 22, the Bible said, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord who would praise the beauty of holiness as they went before the army and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set an ambush against the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who came against Judah, and they were smitten. They were defeated 
by the power of praise. This great truth is seen again in Psalm chapter 8, verse 2. From the children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. So the Bible is simply teaching us that one of the great aspects of the power of praise is that it produces for us victory in our everyday living. I was talking to a young lady this week about the Christian life, and, uh, and she was so excited about what God was doing in her life. And she asked me this question, and she said, why is it that so many people who believed in the Lord, who believe in that book, are living their life defeated? And you know, that is such a sad testimony on the church of the living God. Ladies and gentlemen, we ought to be walking in victory. We ought to be living in victory. We ought to have a swagger about us because we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Isn't that true? Amen. Isn't that true? Yes. Thank you. I've got 15 of you already agreeing with me. I'll get the other 500 caught up with you in just a little bit. And so the Bible teaches that, first of all, that praise is, produces victory. And then it also teaches us that praise produces righteousness. Psalm chapter 50 verse 23 says, He who sacrifices thank offerings honors me and prepares the way so that I can show him the salvation of God. Psalms 106 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord for his good, for his mercy endures forever. This truth is seen in Psalm chapter 35, verse 28 says, And my tongue shall speak of righteousness and of your praise all the day long. The Bible is simply teaching us that when we praise God, we begin to learn the real meaning of righteousness. You say, preacher, why is that? Well, because we begin to recognize the goodness of God. When we praise God, we begin to recognize the goodness of God. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 <clears throat> that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen to me. I want you to get this. When we really come to grips with the goodness of God, it will break the chains of legalism it will destroy the chokehold of denominationalism, and it will set you free to serve God out of a heart of gratitude that is filled with joy. And when that begins to happen, when that begins to happen in my life and, and in your life, and when we realize that Jesus has set us free and there is an indwelling presence of Holy God in the person of the Holy Spirit, it releases you in your Christian law, in your Christian life, to have fun. <coughs> Excuse me. My frog just went crazy. I have issues with my frog sometimes. I have issues with opening a bottle of water, evidently. I asked the doctor, Duke, how long this was going to be. He said, not long, about another year. And you'd be able to talk. <laughs> Linda said he can talk already. <laughs> so the Bible gives us an, an understanding that when we begin to praise the Lord in our everyday living, in our everyday living, I'm not talking about what we do here at church. The praise is not automatic at church either, but you'll never feel comfortable praising God here if you can't praise him out there. If, now listen, you, you've heard me say this in this series. You're going to hear it again next week. Listen to me. If you are not comfortable praising God by yourself, you, I promise you, you're going to be intimidated to praise God here. Hello? Amen. While people are jumping up and screaming and hollering and shouting, you're going to be sitting like this. And you're going to be thinking to yourself, these people are getting on my nerves. Yeah, amen. Now, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you wrote the book. <laughs> Hello? So praise not only gives us a sense of victory and not only a sense of, of joy. Listen what else it gives us. It gives us a sense of confidence. 
Psalm chapter 57, verse 7 said, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. You remember in Luke chapter 2, we have the story of the birth of Jesus. And in verse 20, the Bible said, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. You see, as they began to realize that what they had seen what they had become to understand, they began to praise the Lord and their confidence in the things of God increased. Why is that? Because they realized that the word of God was true. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me today. You really can trust God's promises. You really can trust God's promises. We've been talking about this thing called praise. But the kind of praise that the Word of God speaks about is not just something that you can manufacture. It is not something that we experience through social programs. It's not something that you can experience through positive thinking by itself. It is, it is not something that you can get through a series of self-help techniques. The only, there's only one thing that will cause a person to praise the Lord, and that is to come before him with clean and thankful hearts filled with the love of Jesus. The problem with most of us is that when we think of praise, we think about times of joy and we think about times of happiness and we think about times of uh, how God is obviously blessing our life beyond measure. But child of God, listen to me today. Our praise ought not to be limited to those times of blessings in our life. Our godly praise is something that ought to be a part of our daily walk, even when it comes as if we are overwhelmed by the storms of life. And so, for the next few moments, I want to talk to you about what happens when we respond with praise in those difficult times in our life. In those difficult times in our life, now listen to me carefully. I know, and I don't know who you are, but I know. I know there are some of you that are fighting hell by the acre. I know there are some of you that, that feel like that you've gone through hell sideways this past week or last month or so. I, I, I realize that there are some of you that are probably struggling with your family, struggling with your finances, struggling with your employment, struggling with, with life in general. But I want to, and, and you're the ones I want to talk to. I want to talk to all of you. None of us are here by accident. Isn't that right? I mean, we're all here by, but because of divine appointment. Isn't that right? Yes, all right. But I want to talk to you today about those of you especially who are experiencing difficulties in your life. Maybe you've heard a, a medical report that contradicts the Word of God. Maybe you've heard some bad news that contradicts the Word of God, and you're praying and you're trying to get a handle on God. You're the people I'm talking to this morning. And the first thing that happens when you begin to praise God in these difficult times is it causes you to focus your attention on God. And when that happens, you begin to pray, Lord, I just want to praise you, and I want to thank you for what's going on in my life, and I want to bless your name. I don't understand it. I don't have all the answers, but I know, I know that you've got this. Amen? God's got this. Say it out loud. Yes, he does. So what we're doing when we begin to praise him in this difficult thing, in these difficult circumstances in our life, is that we focus our life, our attention on the person of God. Psalm 113 verse 3 says, From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Psalm 29 verse 1 commands us to ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Now let me just stop here long enough to talk to you about his name just a minute. I want to give you seven redemptive names of our great God. There is Jehovah Shammah, which means the Lord is there or is present. 
Therefore, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. In other words, our God is an omnipresent God who is everywhere all the time. Wherever you are, God is there. Wherever you're going, God's already there. Whatever's going on in your life, God is aware of what's happening because he's there. And then there is the word Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord our peace. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. In a world filled with turmoil, we can know the peace of God that passes understanding. And then there is the name Jehovah Rola, which is God is our shepherd. This is the same name that David used in Psalm chapter 23. The Spirit of God has a name that is tender and caring. It is God's guidance so perfect that we have no will. It is the guiding hand of God that makes us to lie down in green pastures. It is the guiding hand of God that leads us to still waters that are untroubled. Our souls are restored and we are led in righteous paths. Even though we walk through the dark valley of death, we do so without fear. Our heads are anointed with oil and our cups run over. That's why Jesus is called the Good Shepherd because he was willing to lay down his life a ransom for many. Then there's Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. That's why Paul could make this promise in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And there's Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is our banner, our victor, our captain. No wonder we've been told in Romans, thanks be unto God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there is Jehovah's signew, which the Lord our righteousness. Romans chapter 3 verse 21 and 22 says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being righteous, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Watch this. To all and on all who believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 and 31 says, But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that it is written, He who, glorieth, who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Child of God, listen to me carefully. The moment you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sins and make you a Christian, you became righteous in Christ Jesus. No wonder Romans chapter 1 verse 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, when you have the righteousness of God, you are somebody. When you have the righteousness of God, you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. When you have the righteousness of God, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God and predestined for glory. My soul. Then the next name is Jehovah Rapha, which means I am the Lord, your physician. I am the Lord that heals you. With that thought in mind, we are told in Isaiah, surely he has borne our sickness and cured away our pains. You see, you see, listen to me, instead of focusing on our circumstances, instead of focusing on our situations, which causes us to sink further and further in and deeper and deeper in worry and despair. When we begin to praise him, we begin to focus on who, who the person of God, on the blessings of God, on the promises of God, on the joy of God, on the assurances of God. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it is hard to be beat down. It is hard to cower down. It is hard to walk around with this attitude. Oh, Lord, I'm so tired. I am so sick. I am so worn out. I am so no, nobody. I'm just a worm in the dirt. I don't know what's going on. That is a bunch of junk that was born in hell and raised by the devil. Listen, sit up straight, put your shoulders back, you're somebody. 
You're somebody. I'm a child of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. I've been adopted into his family. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. I've been sealed and sealed by the Holy Spirit. I've been predestined for glory. I, I, I know that all of my sins, past, present, and future, have been charged to Calvary. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but that makes me look at that book. That makes me read the promise. That makes me understand what God's got this. The second thing is when we respond in our everyday living by praising God, we, we are recognizing the sovereignty of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. And you begin to pray, Father, I, I thank you that you're in charge of my life. And Father, I trust you and, and, I, and I trust you with my life and I trust you with all the problems and, and I trust you in regards to what's going on around me, Father, I stand today to know that you're God and I'm your kid and I praise you for that. You see, when you begin to praise God in your everyday living, when things aren't all that rosy, you begin to recognize the fact that God is still in charge, not just of your life, but your circumstances. He's never been caught off guard. He knows the ending before the beginning. He knew what you were going to experience before you were ever born. Jesus Christ already took care of all that stuff. Listen, God in his sovereignty knew, God in his sovereignty knew that you are going to be walking in victory today, although Satan tries to convince you that you're walking as a failure. I want you to understand something, that God knows where you are and he cares about you. The third thing is this. When we praise the Lord, we recall the mighty acts of God in our life. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 says, A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. God promised this in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 2, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. Psalm chapter 40 verse 5 says, Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts which are toward us cannot be numbered. In this time of, of difficulty that you're experiencing in your life, you can pray, I thank you, dear God, that you have never failed me in the past. Therefore, I know that I can trust you even today. Let me ask you a question. Has there ever been a time in your life when God has let you down? Has there ever been a time in your life when you needed God the most and he walked away? The answer to those questions is an absolute resounding no. He never has and he never will. You see, when you and I are able in, in the midst of adversity, when we can stand and praise him, we all of a sudden can remember the past faithfulness of God and the past grounds of victory that God has provided. When God prayed for us, listen, when God prayed for us in the person of the Holy Spirit, we talked about this last, last week, oh, my soul downstairs. We talked about when, when we don't know how to pray. Have there been times in your life when you don't know how to pray? Sure they have. You're going through hell sideways and you don't know how to pray. You don't even want to ask God for. You don't know what's going on in your life. You think God's not listening. You think God's turned his back. The heavens have turned to brass. Let me tell you what the word of God says in the book of Romans. It's in that moment that God the Holy Ghost begins to pray for us. Listen, listen, when you don't know how to pray because the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Ghost, he prays for us. He prays for us. 
I don't know what he prays. He said, how you know? Because the Bible says we're just groaning. We're just groaning words. We don't know what we say. That then the Holy Spirit understands what our needs are. And he begins to pray. Guess who he prays to? The Lord Jesus, who is himself. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Have you ever talked to yourself? God the Holy Ghost is praying for us and he's praying to Jesus. And what for? Because Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Man, I appreciate y'all praying for me. Man, I, you know, listen, I'm telling you, I'm standing up here today because y'all prayed for me. I'm standing here today because we stood on the word of God together and we, we ignore, we agree together that God's got this. But let me tell you something, folk. It's something else when Jesus prays for me. Mm -mm -mm -mm. It's something else when Jesus is praying for me. Have you ever, listen, whatever you're going through, you listen to me today, whatever you're experiencing today, whatever you're going through today, whatever difficulty you're going through, whatever, what, when it looks like that the walls are coming, tumbling down around you, remember this, that there is a God in glory who is praying for you. Mm, 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 mm. You don't have to say a thing. You don't have to say a thing. Because he knows the innermost recesses of your life. And he knows your need. And he's praying for you. And when we understand that, when we understand that in the middle of adversity, that we understand the victory is ours, and the peace is ours, and the joy is ours, and, and all the things that God has for us, we understand his sovereignty. Now listen to this. That makes us understand the fourth thing, our dependence on God. Psalm 103, 100, Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God, that it is he that made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, And my God shall supply all, his, all your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. One of the things that bring, praise brings to the surface in our lives is how utterly dependent we are on God's provisions for our life. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. He is the glue that holds it all together. Hello? He's the glue that keeps your life together. He's the glue that keeps my life together. He's the glue that keeps all this stuff together. If Jesus Christ, a sovereign God, were to remove his hands, it would all blow into oblivion. All things were made by him and for him. And by he is before all things. We are dependent on him. We have, we have this illustration. In the book of Revelation, the writer was a man by the name of John. And John found himself an outcast on the Isle of Patmos. John was there, according to Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, because of his testimony for the Lord of glory. And in his old age, he had suffered the ultimate rejection of his society. And he was banished to this little piece of real estate that was nothing more than just a rock. A huge rock filled, I can imagine, with, with crabs and, and moss and nothing much more. And he was banished to live out the remaining days of his life. His surroundings offered no hope. His associates were not able to, to be there to comfort him and to encourage him. 
His friends were far away if they were still alive. He had no idea. He just knew that he was there. And can you imagine what was going on in his mind? And it was in that dark moment, that moment of adversity, that moment of, of seemingly no hope, that moment where there was no answer, in that moment where he wondered if the heavens were gone to brass and there was no one to listen to him. And in that moment, the Word of God says that John had a vision of the glorified Christ in an open door in heaven. But none of these things seem to impress John until the Bible reveals this great truth. And this is what he said. I was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit. It was when the Holy Spirit had freedom, had freedom to do his work in that hopelessness and in that depressive setting. When the Holy Spirit was set free by our willingness to turn it loose, then came the praise and the expectation. The vision of the open door and, and the glorified Christ was soon accompanied by a trumpet-like voice which commanded, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once, John says, at once I was in the Spirit and there was before me in heaven a throne with someone sitting on it. And all of a sudden, John was made to realize that God was still in charge and that everything was still under his control. It was when John found himself in the middle of a mighty service of praise. What had happened to this man? Well, it was through his eyes of faith that he had seen the Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you today on the authority of the Word of God that through his ears of faith, he heard God speaking. And because of his commitment, he allowed the Holy Spirit to reveal to him the reality of his security in Christ Jesus. And the result was a praise service on a rock. No band, no singers, no preaching, no Bible study, nothing that would cause goosebumps, nothing that would cause us to clap because everybody else was clapping, nothing. Just a rock. But on that day, John realized that he wasn't alone on a rock. On that day, he realized that awesome truth that there is an ever-present, omnipotent, sovereign God with him on that rock. And whatever you are going through today, whatever you're experiencing today, whatever, whatever Satan is throwing at you today, whatever he is causing you to fear today, remember this. God has got this. God is still in control. His word is still true. His love is still everlasting and unconditional. His word, his promises still have you in mind. Now you listen to me carefully. I don't know what the banker said. I don't know what your employer said. I don't know what your wife or husband said. I don't know what your kids 
have said. I don't know what your doctor has said. But I can tell you this. God has another report. God has another report. And I promise you today, on the authority of the Word of God, you, by faith, can believe God's report. I've said it before, and I want you to nail this down. When your faith when your faith and the Word of God becomes more real to you than the pain and the report and the gossip and the junk that Satan is throwing in your life, then you can stand up and shout, Thank you, Jesus. I know that you have this because you have me. Amen. Say so you're right, preacher. Let's stand together. If you're here today and you never invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, forgive your sins and make you a Christian, I encourage you to do that today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you'll make this your prayer, I want you to lift your hands straight up. If you're visiting, it's all right to hold your hands up if you're not in the business meeting. See, most Baptists didn't know you could hold your hands up in church unless they was voting against something. Well, today we're voting for something. Say it out loud with me, Father. Thank you for reminding me of your divine watch care over my life. Thank you for the promises that you've given me in your word. Give me the determination to live my life as a thankful life filled with joy and filled with praise. I can because I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me in Jesus' name. Amen. What God has put on your heart, I want you to step out from where you are. Make your way to the front. You come right now. If you need to invite Christ into your life, I want you to come. If God's speaking to you about church membership, I want you to come. If God's speaking to you about something else, I want you to come. If you need to be prayed for, I want you to come. If you need, you need have any need in your life, whatever it is, I want you to come share with this church. You come right now as God speaks to you.